Hi everyone. Good afternoon. It's a great crowd, so it's nice to see all of you here today. Um, I'm Pat Zulik, and I'd like to welcome you to the 2023 kickoff of the Turner Lecture Series. As you probably know, um, this series uh, was made possible by a generous donation by Evelyn Turner and her family in support of educational activities here uh, in honor and memory of her husband, um, Andy Turner, who um, is one of our uh, founding members. Um, so um, I'd like to thank all of you for being here today and any of you that feel the urge to donate to this series, we have a, a nice big container there at the door, so we appreciate that. <laughs> um, so today, as you know, we have workshop director John England, um, who will, as I understand, share the museum's boat building history. We'll talk about the um, interesting uh, renovations that were done in the FD Crockett and, and things that are going on in the boat shop. Um, I did want to mention that we have two other lectures this year in the series uh, to look forward to. We have Leonard Powell, who will be coming here. He's the owner-operator, as you probably know, of Powell's Marina. He will speak on February 12th. And then we um, wrap up with our third lecture on March 12th, and that will be the Tidewater Oyster Gardeners Association, or TOGA. And that will be a great one because they will talk about not only oyster history, but also how you might set up your own oyster garden. So that will be a great one. All of them are at 2 o'clock, uh, again, February 12th and March 12th. Um, now, as many of you know, um, John England's on our board. He is um, the boat shop director, and in that role and capacity, as many of you know, he volunteers here more than 1,000 hours every single year. Um, and uh, which is a huge amount of time that he gives here. Um, and I just want to mention, I know he probably doesn't want me to say anything about it, he has a pretty interesting bio, just for those of you who know him, may not know a few things of interest about John, is that he is the fourth great-grandson of a uh, Prince Edward Island shipbuilder. Um, he also worked in the engineering department at the Newport News Ship yard. Um, of course, he is a very experienced and longtime boat builder. He is a professional home builder. Um, in addition to all of that, and all the time here, he also finds time to help in the community. And, and one thing of note for, um, is that he manages and has managed the waterfront at the Urbana Oyster Festival for 25 years. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to come out.
actually started on this property as an old stable that was, that was there. And uh, uh, I'll bring up Steve Smith, a -A AKA Captain Crunch. And I think most of you know who that was. Uh, I'll refer to him as Crunch, like most people did. Uh, took it upon himself with his, his imagination, very creative, uh, determined man and stubborn at times. Went on with, from that little uh, stable that was there, added a piece on the boat shop. Uh, and that got things started. And actually we added, and then added that shed on it later on. Uh, going to the next one. Um, we also started uh, the family boat building thing, which was, which was a big hit here, and I'll get into that in a minute. This, this particular picture, this is the uh, uh, a little uh, flat bottom skiff, and I, I just, I really like this picture, I think it's really neat. Uh, but this was actually the first project that we did here at the museum. Uh, and Crunch headed all that up to, uh, to do it. It's actually, we had a uh, John Wright skiff here. Uh, John Wright was a, a well-known builder here in Deltaville. Most of you have heard of him if you've been around here any time at all. And he didn't just build skiffs, he built boats up actually over 60 feet, some uh, deck boats and so on. Um, but then this boat became the prototype for a family boat builder. Uh, it went away and it came back, and then I, when I got it back about 10 years ago, we converted it into the uh, push boat for the FD Rocket. And that's where it got the name Ferdinand, uh, from Ferdinand to Soda Crockett was the man that the boat was named, the big boat was named after. Uh, and like I say, for the family boat building, and this was one of Crunch's big projects. Uh, Wooden Boat Magazine, uh, early, early this century, put out sort of a challenge to see if people would do uh, small boat building projects like weekend, where they could, weekends where people could come and build up a little black bottom skiff, families could get together and so on. Uh, and it, it was pretty popular, it didn't last too long, but uh, uh, but Crunch, he always got to go big. So he said, you know, we could probably build a flat bottom skiff and we could base it on this John Wright skiff, but we're not going to do a plywood boat. We're going to build the real thing. So set out to do it and you're in that picture there now. The, <laughs> that's Crunch going to town. And, and of course, for those of you who don't, don't know Crunch, that's where the name Captain Crunch comes from right there. That picture right there is, is uh, the epitome of, of Captain Crunch. Um, but at any rate, he struggled along trying to put things together. And, but we managed every year since 2003 to build eight or 10 or 12, 15 boats one year. Uh, for the family boat building uh, project. Uh, Chuck Guinness got involved in it later on, thank God. And he took over, he took over the project. Much better organized and, uh, you know, put some structure to it. And with Chuck in there, we managed to uh, improve the, the whole process every year. We, uh, come up with new ideas and new ways to make it simpler and pre by pre-cutting certain pieces, but everybody, everybody that works on it um, gets to cut certain things and, and do some different parts of it. So it's, it's really been a good, uh, uh, a fun, it's been fun for us here at the museum as well as the, the multi-generations that come, come in and, and, and build these boats. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, other boats that we handled at the at, uh, in the boat shop. One was the Apprentice. This is one again. Captain Crunch got into this one too. He managed to get a contract from uh, the school of Virginia, who were looking for a ship's boat, and he said, "Well, I think we can do that. That would be a good project for us." So sure enough, he got the contract. And at least he was smart enough to work and hire Stefan Power, who was a really good boat builder. 
and uh, he helped out with Crunch ran the show pretty much and helped with it and did a lot of work uh, along with some other volunteers. Uh, but Stefan was really a, really a help in that. Um, the next, the Explorer. The Explorer, now this, this was right up Crunch's alley. Uh, the Jamestown 400th was coming in in 2007, and they were, they put, kind of put out uh, the word that they would like to see some people try to build some kind of a uh, replica of or interpretation of what John Smith might have uh, used to sail around the uh, Chesapeake Bay, which he ultimately did in what, 1708, 1709, 1608, sorry about that, uh, 400. Um, but then the group, so there were three of them built, and uh, ours is the only one that's still alive and well. Reedville did one that uh, lasted for a little while, and the Sultana Project up in Chestertown uh, did one, uh, actually, and it was, it was supported by the National Geographic Society. Boy, that would have been nice if we could have had that done. Uh, but we did it on our own, uh, but we put something a little different, and it's still active today, and it's really been a big success for us. Uh, and it's actually gone off to different places. It's been in movies and used as backdrops for a lot of different things, and we've had it all over the place. Uh, explore. Next one, the FD Crockett was the big project, and that certainly was a big project. This is where I really came into the picture. Again, Crunch um, thought that this would be a good project for us. <laughs> I don't know where you got that idea. Um, and I think some of you probably saw it when it came in here. Uh, and it, it, it looks pretty derelict in that picture right there, but uh, it, uh, it, was, it was a lot worse than the book. <laughs> Believe me. Uh, it got towed up here in uh, I believe it was September of 05, I think it was, uh, by the East Hampton, the Bible out in front of it, it was owned by a good friend of mine, Dave Rollins from then in uh, Pocosin. Uh, they basically towed it up here with a hatchet at the back of their boat just in case they needed to cut the line. <laughs> if it started going down, it was, it was just going to stay there. He, he died tail, but I'm sure it'll go back to Pocosin. But it made it up here anyway. Uh, and from that, uh, we we got it in there, we started taking things apart and so on, and we really weren't sure what we were going to do with it. I was sort of of the opinion that maybe we should just take it up the creek and let it die a good death. But uh, we said, well, let's, let's get the pilot house off and take it back to the museum. And, and we took some other things out of the boat that was over here, so the Delville Boatyard. Um, and then what we can do is maybe we can build a new pilot house. That would be a nice little decoration if we needed it. And if we don't do the boat, then, you know, that'll be okay too. Uh, so, again, Stefan Auer, the, the boat builder who had uh, a chunk, a crunch had got to help with some of the other projects, was still here and looking for some work. So he and I, that winter, went on and built uh, the pilot house. And in the meantime, the board of directors here, um, and, and and I also, we went and hauled the boat out and I had a good survey of the boat and got, uh, you know, checked everything out to see if, is it worth doing anything with or not? And so we uh, finally decided that the main logs in the boat, it being a log boat, not just a flying on frame boat, uh, and it being a unique boat, that perhaps uh, we could do something with it. So, at any rate, that was decided, and uh, from that point, uh, we, we finished, the, finished the pilot house and put it out there. Uh, yeah, you already had that. Um, and then I started in, uh, <laughs> I knew it was gonna be a project, let me tell you that. And it was every, everything that I expected. I can't 
say that. Well, I had surprises. You always expect those, but as far as did I know what I was getting into? Yeah, I probably had an idea. But it was a challenge, and everybody likes a challenge, and it certainly was. Um, we started off just to kind of go through what we did. Uh, I did some frames in there to try to hold the, hold the shape, and that first winter, we took it over to Deagle's uh, Railway and pulled it up in the shed on one side, and we rebuilt the, uh, all the chunks in the bow, uh, put it back in the water that year, took it back, back over here, because we wanted to keep it in the water. We didn't want it out of the water any longer than we had to. Brought it back over here to the museum, and uh, uh, in the water, we started taking the chunks off the sides, started replanking back down from the shear line down to the water. Uh, it was a little tenuous out there with about a six inch freeboard right, uh, right on the creek there. And uh, my fear was somebody, some kids would come in here with a speedboat and want to put a big wake out there and would have sunk the boat for sure. Uh, but we, uh, we did all we could do to it there and got it ready to go back over to the railway uh, the following winter. And the second year, what we ended up doing, we had to essentially tear the whole stern off the boat, the horn timber and everything. I hope the horn timber, which is the piece that comes up and holds all the thing together in the back, I was hoping it might be okay, but as I got into it, it was not. So we ended up taking everything out and totally rebuilding that stern uh, and finishing the planking and so on. So she came back over here with the hull pretty much intact. We went on from that and uh, uh, put the deck beams in, finished putting deck beams in and, and finished the decks. Uh, and that year we took the boat back over by the bulkhead on, uh, on the uh, railway, over the Eagles Marine Railway. And with the crane, we were able to uh, uh, set one day. It was probably the only day of the whole project that everything went to plan. And it was a good day for that. Uh, we carried everything over there, the pilot house, the, the mast, which is the old mast that was in the boat that I had re reworked, uh, and the uh, 71 diesel that was going to go in, we took that over also. So that day, in three hours, we were able to put the motor down into the boat. We fit the pilot house, which was a matter of setting it on top of the deck where I wanted it, tracing a line around, picking it back up, cutting out so it would sit down on the deck beams, put that bag on and clamped it down onto the boat and then set the mast and kind of tied it off separately. And, uh, and then brought it back to the museum for another year or two. Well, we did a whole lot of fitting out and putting things together. Um, and then what we had, we got it operational by 2010, but still a lot more to be done. And we decided at this point that uh, it would be kind of neat to do a family reunion of this boat. I mean, these, all of these old boats have a lot of back story to them. They, they're something that were owned, owned by a family, built by somebody, they, you know, they have a, they really have a backstory with them. Well, this particular boat, the main people involved were Crockett's, Alex Gaines, who was actually the log builder. He built the log portion of the boat. The Smiths at Smith Railway, uh, out in Dare, and, uh, and the Greens, this, and this family, the Green family, was attached to the people who owned the boat for over 50 years and ran the boat. Um, this uh, okay. Well, we okay. We had we had would we have like sixty or seventy people? Yeah. I think for the, for that uh, picnic, and it was it was multi generational uh, all the way down the line. Okay, this is the this is the Green family. This is four generations of the Green family, and the 
little guy in the pilot house, I think he needs to grow a few more years um, before he can take the boat over. But uh, uh, he was he was anxious. He was ready to go. Uh, another one um, was uh, Doug Smith. Now Doug Smith was actually related on both sides, the Greens and the Smiths side. But Doc, when he was 14 years old, he told his daddy, you know, I've got enough school, I'm tired of this. I want to go to work. So his daddy said, well, okay, I can get you a job on the F.D. Crockett with your Uncle Purdy. They called him Purdy Green, the man that ran it. And so, yeah, okay, he can do it. Well, that November, he went to work with Purdy Green out there dredging oysters on the bay and planting oyster seed and all that. And what he found out was there was a whole lot of shovel work, shoveling oysters onto the boat and shoveling oyster shells off the boat. And just a lot of hard work, cold weather. It's just, it's not an easy life. Well, after two years of that, he decided, well, maybe I'll go back to school. <laughs> so he did. And, but he didn't last too long there. He, decided again that he didn't, he didn't want to go to school anymore. But this time he went to his daddy again, but he, came, he went to him prepared. He had already talked to a plumber about uh, working with him and apprenticing, and ultimately he became a plumber. The water was not for him. So, um, another thing that they did on these boats quite often is that the picture there now. Uh, this was at, this was after the reunion. We took the boat out and we took the family, some of the family members out for boat cruises. And this is typical. This is, it was certainly appropriate because most all of these boats uh, were worked six days a week. Most of them did not work on Sundays at all. But quite often. The families would get together, they would have a picnic either on the boat or at home, and then they would take the boat out for a boat ride. And all, I'd say probably 70, 80 percent of these boats were used like that. And I think even today, some of the dead rise boats uh, do the same thing on occasion, take the family out for some enjoyment. And uh, so that was, that was appropriate, is, uh, is what, I had, what I had thought anyway. Um, this is a picture now. It's, it's, it's one of my favorite times on the bay. I was probably about quarter to six in the morning going out on the bay with the sunrise coming up. Uh, but in this particular case, this was our first time that we actually took the boat back to Pocosin. We went down there, that's actually in the back river, but uh, we went down there for the boat pieces and uh, had, had a lot of of family members join us down there and uh, and so on. Um, this uh, and that also has the picture of uh, make sure I'm in the right place here. Uh, okay, the picture with, with me with the crew and Alberta Flowers. And Alberta Flowers was the grandson of grand granddaughter of F.D. Crockett and F.D. and Betty Crockett. Uh, she was actually born the same day the boat was built, mm -hmm. and she just passed away this past year. So she lived a long life. She talked to. She had all kinds of stories to talk about uh, that related to the boat, and she remembers uh, as a young child being able to go out there and play house on the boat with the dolls and all this kind of stuff. Um, right, and, and then let's see, the, the Crockett was completed actually 2012. We actually completed the project because all these projects are ongoing after that. But, uh, uh, we, you know, officially we finished it and we were actually able to get historic, national historic landmark designation for the boat uh, at that time. So that was that was quite a quite quite a lot of work there. <laughs> that was to say the least. Um, all right. The next thing 
That's one project that we did. There are other projects that we did. Another job that the book shop would do uh, is maintenance on uh, some of the uh, static exhibits that we have, the books that we have in our collection, along with the books that are in the water. Uh, one of the books that we have is the, is the Francis C. It's uh, uh, of 1946 by Milton Price, the Price of Boatyard. Uh, the prices were, uh, actually there were two generations there. There was Linwood and Milton Price that built a lot of boats around this area, and some big ones too, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the main reason I wanted the Francis C in here is because it's just a good example of the Delta Bill Round Stern Dead Rise, which was so typical in the area. Uh, yeah, another boat that we got was, and this one has a cute story, Robert Green built this 17-foot skiff for R.C. Hudson, who started and ran uh, Ocean Products over in Matthews. Um, Robert built it for him back in the mid-'80s, and he said he delivered it to him over in a, a warehouse that Mr. Hudson had over on Gwen's Island, uh, and evidently it sat there for a long time. Mr. Hudson's two boys run the business now, and they called us, I guess, I guess about three or four years ago, and said, we're cleaning out one of the warehouses over on Gwen's Island, and uh, we came across this dead rise skiff in there that my father had built in the back in the 80s. Would you be interested in it at the museum? And of course, I jumped at that. Well, come to find out, it's been there ever since the mid 80s. <laughs> and it was evidently covered with stuff. They said they couldn't even find it in here until they emptied out the, the place. So we brought it back, and I can guarantee you there's probably one boat that was built in Delta Bill that never leaked. Jenny May. This is, I guess, the, the newest, the latest boat that we've got here at the museum. We have had a series of boats uh, that Captain Pete Cardozo, who's here in the audience right now, in the real, in real, the real life man, right there, uh, has 
been doing our creek cruises uh, every summer uh, when we have uh, our uh, market days. We've had a number of boats that have been donated over the years, and then we've turned around and sold that from under them that he's been using in the, in the creek cruises. And so finally, when this one came up, uh, and it was a donation, believe it or not, I knew the boat already, and I went to look at it, and sure enough, it was just as good a boat as I had, had thought it was before. Um, it was actually built by Dave Rollins, uh, boy, who owned the East Hampton, I told, told you about earlier. Um, and so we got it up here, and Pete's been running it now for the last two years. We've had it, Pete? I think uh, three years. Three years, okay. Time goes by. Um, but at any rate, so, and it's, it's a pretty little 35 foot round stone and dead rise boat. So it's, it's appropriate for this, and it's, and it's, uh, it's been a big, a big success uh, for us, and been happy to have it. Uh, a boat, and we keep it in an in a inside shed right now, too. It's really been, it's been nice. It's one book that I haven't had to do a whole lot of work on. Uh, we've also worked on some other other boats along the way that get donated. Um, generally, we try not to take boats that are in bad shape, but quite often we'll get something that's worth having and worth a lot of money, and we'll get it here and, and we'll do we'll do a little bit of work on it if we need to, and we've had that to, to do uh, every every so often. Um, and there have been, there have been a lot of other books we've worked on, but at this point, um, I want to talk a little bit more about where we are now in the new boat shop. And uh, as you can see in, in this slide, we, we tore down, we tore down that old stable that was in the back and pulled most of that little shed roof off the front, and we finally built a new a new uh, a new boat shop. Um, and so what we've started doing in here, in fact, actually before we before we actually built that, um, we started building actually building dead rise boats here uh, at, the, at the museum. And the main thing we're trying to do with this is to build dead rise boats by rack of eye, which is the way that they were built. And they say basically building boats without plans, without formal plans, but everybody had a plan when they started to build a boat. If it was in their head or written down on a scratch paper somewhere or whatever. And uh, in the meantime, I have been uh, doing a lot of uh, visiting boat builders and interviews with boat builders and so on. And uh, uh, Willard Norris, who just passed away here a few years ago, uh, I had actually documented him building uh, several dead rise boats that he did in the last 10, 10 years or so. Uh, in addition to that, as, as part of, uh, of our interpretive stuff here at the museum, uh, we've done interviews with, with a number of boat builders, and actually I've got a list of uh, quite a few more that I want to work with, uh, with the help of Larry Juning and uh, our archivist David Moran here at the, at the museum. Uh, we've done, at this point, we've done uh, interviews with uh, Roy Jenkins, who was actually a, uh, was a guinea man and uh, used to build, he's actually lives in Middlesex now and is still building a few boats. Uh, Robert Green, uh, who was built that little 17 foot skip I talked about. He's not, he's not building boats, hasn't built a boat now for probably 20 years, um, but still around. And we had, a, we had a really good interview with him. Uh, we've done interviews with Willard and Tuna Norris, his son, uh, after, after Willard died. Uh, and he brought, us, he brought us a bunch of old information that Willard had used in, in setting up boats and building boats and, and how he contracted the boats and people that he built boats for, uh, a listing of all the boats he built. I mean, it's just a lot of information. Uh, we've also done, just recently done one with George Butler from up in Reedville, a very good friend of mine. He's still building some boats on his own, but he sold the railway that he had up there. But, uh, and I've all, 
also I also did some work just myself uh, with Edward Diggs taking notes and so on. Another well-known uh, bay builder from over in Matthews County, a really uh, another good friend that I've known for a long time. Kathy, and he passed away, I guess, ten years ago. Then, um, basically, what we're trying to do is pass along these skills uh, to people and try to record how these things are done and by actually doing this out in the, in the boat shop, uh, people can come by and see how we actually set up a boat and lay them out and, uh, uh, and are able to actually finish them off. Um, and anybody that's worked with me out there can see that how we, how we go, we get certain things that we lay out, certain dimensions that we do, and certain angles to a stem or a transom, a certain width where we put the spreader board, sort of bend the boards around. Uh, a lot of things like that. We get up to doing the frames and doing the shear line, and uh, we've got a starting point in the front and the back, but we bend a great big batten down there and look at it and see what we like. And if I get it to where I want it, we say, okay, this is where we're gonna put it. Uh, and uh, it's just, it's the way they were done. They were, it's the way they were done. Everyone was different, probably. Uh, and of course, I know anyway, when anytime you do something like this, every time you do it, you're gonna be trying to improve on the, on the process. And you're always trying to do a better way, a faster way, or whatever. Uh, and we're doing the same thing. Uh, I'm gonna give you sort of a list of the boats that we've built so far. We're working on what's actually the uh, the fifth and sixth, even though they're numbered four and five. Um, but we started by doing one of Willard Norris's boats, since I just documented all that. <coughs> Willard was still alive when we, when we started this project, in fact, all the way through it. Uh, it's Hull 101. And uh, it's basically a 20 foot dead rise based on Willard Norris's layouts, ankles, and, and those kind of things, different uh, uh, parts that make it sort of typical of the style boat that he was building. Um, and then we went on the next one. Actually, this is this is where we we started Hull 102. Now this one was actually based on <coughs> Lewis Wright skiff. This was another Wright boat skiff boat builder over on Lovers Lane, um, and I happened upon. <coughs> boat that he had built that was over in it. I saw it over in the marsh over in Gwen's Island. And it caught my eye just driving by. I said, where the devil did that boat come from? And so I pulled in there and looked at it and come to find out, asking around if it was one of Lewis Rice skiffs that got left up there. Uh, it still had its lines and the sides, the sides were pretty good, but if it, it tried to pick the boat up, I think the bottom would have stayed where it was. <laughs> so uh, I basically went back over with one of the other boys and we started taking numbers off. And uh, I've got a little system I use to, uh, uh, to get the angles and so on for the stems and the sterns and, and all the way down the sides, different things, and I take them. Uh, where, the, where the chime comes in and meets the stem, how far up from the keel, and just a lot of things where I can uh, go back to the shop. And with, with the numbers I've got and the, and the different information, I can start to lay out, lay out a boat and, uh, and make it look pretty much like the, uh, like the Lewis Wright skiffs. So that's what we did with this one. We started it and we built it out underneath that shed roof, the old shed roof that was in the front of the, of the uh, old boat shop. Uh, when I got through with that and turned it over, we put it on a trailer and took it back over, over to the other shed over there and put it away for a while. And then we went to, went to work building the new boat shop that's out there now. So it, it actually took a long time to build this one because we built a boat house in the, middle, in the boat shop in the middle of the whole project. Um, but it was the first one finished in the new boat shop because we brought it back after we finished the boat shop and uh, set it back up in there and put the frames in and, and climbed it and went on and finished the whole thing. And, uh, and I, I, did, I, mean, I did this little video. This was my first attempt at trying to do videos on my computer and uh, 
took a long time to do this little thing, and I don't think I'm going to try to do too many more. Uh, but it's, it's kind of a neat little video, so I thought I'd let you see it. We get to play with them some of the time. <laughs> Mostly we just build them and work on them. It's, it's that one percent of the time that you get to play with them. Uh, we had a good, we had a good day that day. I think. I think. Um, that was that was Roland Anderson was the guy on the on the video, <laughs> and Pete was running the boat. Um, all right, the next one, the next boat we did. It's called 103, and this this one this one this is a 16 foot version of a Lewis Wright based on those Lewis Wright uh, uh, plans that I had, ideas that I had. Um, and what we started doing, which is kind of unique, again, you're always doing something different, trying something different. This one we started doing what we call a laminated bottom line. instead of doing them conventionally cross plank uh, with just a single layer dry fit that swells up, uh, we decided to do a bottom that would stay intact and, and not move around. So what we started doing was two layers, we cross plank the bottom, so if you looked in it from inside, you'd think it was a conventional cross plank bottom. But then we come back on the diagonal, which you can see in that picture, uh, and uh, glue all that together with epoxy. <laughs> And it makes it one heck of a stiff bottom on that. And, and, and no fiberglass work, which is a, a big plus as far as I'm concerned. We did do a fiber, by the way, we did do a fiberglass bottom on the Willard Norris. That's the next one. I'll get to that. That's a different Willard Norris. Um, anyway, that's, that's one. And that one, uh, Roland was uh, worked, because he worked on the boat with me. But he liked it so much, he decided to buy it for himself. So I said, we could, we could work, we could probably work that out. So, so anyway, he's got it now, and he's had a good time with it, and uh, put a lot of hours on it. So, uh, anyway, the next boat that we built, this is, this was an opportunity that I never thought I'd, I'd have. Uh, before Will had died, <clears throat> he and his grandson, uh, Ryan Norris. Well, actually, he had helped Brian build several boats, and I, he was in there when I was documenting some of the other boats. Uh, he had started another one, and uh, <coughs> had, wasn't able to finish it with him, and he didn't get very far with it, and you can see in that picture, he, he'd maybe done a third of the bottom uh, on it, and it sat there for a number of years after uh, Willard was unable to work on it, and then after he died, they sold the place, and they had to get the boat out of there. So they called the museum to see were we interested in uh, taking the boat. And uh, of course I thought that was probably a good idea. And so we went over and looked at it, and sure enough, um, it had been sitting there, it had lost a little bit of its shape, the, the keel had bent down a little bit and so on. But I said, this, this is certainly something that we can take on. So. Uh, we went over there and got it and towed it back over here, set it up in the book shop, and went on and finished it uh, pretty much the way Willard would have finished it, with just a single cross plank bottom. And this one we did fiberglass because that's the way he was doing it. Uh, and we glassed that whole bottom on it and, uh, and turned it over. And, uh, um, oh, yeah. Does anybody know what a keel bullet is? <laughs> well, I didn't either, but uh, <laughs> that's one right there. I, and I've heard, I'd heard of this happening before, but I'd never done it myself. Uh, as you work that, it's an eight by eight keel, pine keel on that particular boat. And you use the whole eight valve, most of the eight by eight until you get up near the bow, and then a lot of it goes away, and it just gets down and you, where you put that staving up and uh, I had the electric plane there just, just getting rid of uh, a whole lot of the, uh, of, the, of the meat that's up there, got it out of the way, and all of a sudden 
up, and I, I got a funny little sound with the planer, and I hit it one or two more times. And I said, what the devil was that? And I looked and started digging, and sure enough, <laughs> it comes a lead bullet with a, uh, with a copper casing around it. So somebody had shot in that tree back when, when the tree was about eight cool. years old or something. <laughs> it was just buried down in that. So that was, kind of, that was a unique experience, to say the least. Um, and then, okay, then we went on, we turned the boat over, and you can see us turning that boat. That was the biggest boat we turned over in there so far. Uh, and that wasn't like this smaller boat, you can almost manhandle that one at the bottom and pick them up and turn them over. Uh, but this was a little bit more of a project. So we <coughs> turned it all up so we could roll it over, and you can see us see us doing that. We got the whole crew in there and uh, picked it up and, and uh, pulled it over and set it, we reset it all up again and then uh, went on to finishing it off. And there, there it is finished off on that left side. And uh, you know, the guy that got it, we actually sold it to a waterman over on the eastern shore. Uh, it sold quickly. I was actually surprised it went as quickly as it did. Uh, but it's really a neat boat, but uh, I never got to play with this one myself, but he did send us those pictures after he got it set up. Uh, of it out there, I guess, doing his sea trials on it. And that's also a little picture of, of, uh, uh, of Willie there in a shop, one of the pictures that I took earlier when, uh, when I was going, going, over, going by there and documenting what he was doing. Uh, <coughs> he, was, he was certainly a mentor and a, I think it helped to me just getting started and, and learning how to build these boats. I had, I just mentioned, I, I built a lot of boats, a lot of small boats, worked on a lot of boats for probably over 50 years. Um, in fact, it has been over 50 years. Um, but these are actually, these are the first time I ever built boats without a plan starting out, without a formal plan starting out. Uh, and they're really, they're really pretty simple to build. And they're a lot of fun to build. I'm really getting a kick out of doing these, these boats. Um, we did, uh, okay, since then, we finished the Nara Skiff. And now, and so now we're up pretty much, uh, pretty much to where we, uh, where we are now. And we've got all 104 and 105 in there. We're actually doing two boats this time. We're getting, we're getting kind of crazy. <laughs> but uh, I said, what the heck, we did one, we picked it up and turned it over and set it to the side, and now I got a little jig I, I set up to, when we started, and so we, we went ahead and started another one, and the other day we just turned that one over and built it, and now we're going to finish it right on top of the jig that was there. Um, but what we're able to do with these boats being in the shop, uh, people can come by and see different stages of what we're doing from time to time. In fact, you can see two of them in there now, two different stages. Uh, each of these, like I say, each of these boats are built, they're always different. One's always a little different from another. We're always going to try something new and <coughs> tweak these things a little bit. Um, I'm, and, and <coughs> excuse me. Um, another thing that I'll just mention is that all of these boats, they're all dead rise boats, and they're sort of all the same, the V bottom boats, but they're all different because every builder had a different eye and had different ideas about what he wanted to do with them. And uh, a lot of them over the years, especially uh, guys that have uh, used a lot of these boats and worked beside them all over the bay uh, for a long time, they can pick out who built a certain boat. If they see it coming down the bay, they can pretty much tell by the uh, shear line or cabin that's on the boat or, or whatever, you, the, shape, the shape of the side of the boat and so on, uh, who the builder was. And so, yes, they're all the same to, to somebody who's not, uh, not familiar with them, but they're all a little bit different. And I guarantee, I guarantee you that every one I've done So anyway, um, that's 
basically what I've got, the only wrap up I've got, and I, I want to go back and kind of emphasize something I talked about earlier. Um, the, whole, the, whole, the whole reason, but I, I'm not done yet. <laughs> the, whole, the whole reason that, uh, uh, that I really get into this, <coughs> the reason that museums have boats and have other artifacts is because there's more to it than just the artifacts. There is a story there behind all of these artifacts. And the boats are something that, that will stay here for a long time, even after, after the people who created the stories have gone. And so they're sort of a catalyst for the, for the next generation to come along and, and ask about this boat and see, uh, or, or any artifact, and see what the backstory is, see how it, how it influenced a particular uh, family, how the, <coughs> the captain of the boat worked the boat, how he supported his family with it, how it fit into the whole community, because all of this stuff goes back to um, how, it, you know, how the whole thing fits together. And that's really uh, the important point that, uh, that I want to make here today regards to artifacts in, in museums and I.D. the boats. And so I think now, of course, in addition to that, we're trying to, to um, like I said, record, try to do the building by new, building new boats to actually retain and record uh, some of the, the processes that were, that were done in the past so that maybe people can uh, see over time just how, how these things were done and pass on some of that knowledge. Anyway, and then uh, you've got, okay, that's that's good. But what happened to the? Oh, they saw it. Oh, they saw it. They saw, <laughs> they saw, they saw the most important part of the whole thing. <laughs> I can tell you, she, she and I both, especially her at work, are, you know what's on, trying to put all this stuff together in the last two weeks. So um, it's certainly, uh, I, can't, I can't do it alone. Like any of this stuff, I can't do it alone. I can't run the boat shop alone. And we're always looking for volunteers that, uh, uh, that want to help out with things. Um, I've got several of my volunteers right here now. Um, but, uh, but at any rate, um, I'm open for questions. Any questions they want to answer at this point? Yes, sir. I believe I heard you mention ankle. Is that correct? Did I get that right? Keel bullet. Is that what it was? No. Angles, angles to the stem or transom. Uh, I don't know. No. I'm on, sorry. No, I, I'll have to put a slide in with an angle on it.
um, earlier sailing vessels and the skills that they had. You got to remember also when boat builders were trans, uh, kind of transferring from the older to the newer style of boat, and a lot of the, the techniques that they used coming along were used in the building around. You know, there's no direct connection, but but I mean that's the story that I've heard is they like they like to have um, they, want, they like that corner in the back of the boat that things could get hung up on, and then, so I think that makes makes some sense. Makes some sense. John was a, a preferred lumber to use in the area, and were the, were the builders known for using a particular type of lumber? But it was different than the one. And the question is, uh, what types of lumber were there certain builders that use certain types and others that use other types? Certainly started off that most of the lumber they were using way back when was locally sourced, no question about it. And we know that uh, uh, Whitaker Lumber, that had a great big lumber yard up in Hartfield, uh, back in where the, where the uh, convenience center is now, there used to be a tre tremendous pile of sawdust back in there some years ago. It's all gone now. Mm -hmm. um, but they supplied local timbers, and, and um, I think I think most all the boat builders were using that at one time. But as that some of those materials kind of got um, used up, like what they call spruce pine, because there isn't much of that left around. It was actually it was actually pine, not spruce, but it was a slow slow growing Virginia pine, uh, which was a good quality wood. The most of the pines you see around here now really aren't, aren't worth putting in a boat. Um, the long lobby is just it's a faster growing pine and it, it's not rock resistant at all. Um, but so they evolved from that. Um, they definitely used a lot of white cedar and and cypress. Uh, the cypress was pretty well available around here, up Dragon Run. That was full of cypress up there, and, and white oak. Um, and, the, and the white cedar was certainly available in North Carolina. Um, and a lot of the guys used white, Atlantic white cedar on the boats, and that's what we're using on them right now. Um, and the other big thing was they, they started using fur when they weren't able to get good keel material and so on. Um, they would get uh, fur, which actually was coming from the West Coast. And most of, the, most of that, what you see, is shipped across in big cans uh, in, on rail. And then when they get into Richmond or Norfolk or whatever, uh, a boat yard there would have them and they would, they would resaw all of this stuff and make whatever it is that people wanted out of the fur. So there were big timbers available and the, uh, the boat builders would go down uh, either to, uh, to, to uh, Norfolk or he could look for Richmond somewhere uh, and get uh, keel material and framing material and so on, bring it back. And uh, so that was pretty common uh, uh, material used in, in building boats in the area, no question about it. Did some use, some did, I guess, I don't know, that's a good question. I, I can't really say for sure, but I'd say they all pretty much used the same materials, one, one, depending upon what was available to them, really. You know, and, it, and it definitely evolved over time. Anybody else? Yeah, the empty Crockett is called a log. It's yes, it's a log boat. It's act, it's actually, uh, and that's a that's a good point. Um, one thing I didn't bring up was uh, people. A lot of people ask me why did I take on the project of empty <laughs> Crockett. And what you asked is because that laid right into that into that question. Um, it's a log boat, and they were, they, were, they were typically built in the Pocosin area, uh, a lot of them, probably thousands of them over the years, actually built out of logs pinned together and shaped into the, sculpted into the uh, final hull design. And in fact, the Crockett, which was typical to that area, also used what they called chunk sides. So it was actually just big pieces of, of lumber put together. 
and then sculpt it into a boat. Now, what species of lumber? It would have been pine. Okay. Everything, it was all pine. I mean, they had, you know, back then they had nice big pine logs. Yeah. And basically, that's the, the Crockett is probably, uh, we think, one of the last big log boats built in that area. And it's the only big log boat left in the state of Virginia. And one of only three left on the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, and that's, that's got a lot to do with why I took on that project. Had it been a plank on frame boat that was in the shape that I was in, no, I wouldn't have touched it. No question about it. Because there's still plenty of them around. Well, not plenty of them. There's still a few good ones uh, left around. Any other thoughts? Way in the back, Bill. Yeah. Hi. John, uh, you mentioned about three nine loggers. What, uh, I think one's up the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum. Where's the third one? Yeah, about where the, the, the three log boats, uh, log deck boats are. Uh, one of them is the Old Point, which is a, is a, is a Pocosian style. It's up at St. Michael's Museum. It was rebuilt up there some years ago. The other one is at Solomon's Museum, and it's actually uh, a bug eye, an old sailing bug eye that was converted uh, into a by boat, a deck boat, uh, in the early 1900s, and it's still operating today with a Coast Guard license to carry passengers. <laughs> and, that's but it, it, it has problems. But it, it's it's something if you if you go and that's a good museum to go to if you're really interested in, in bay boats. It's the Solomon's uh, Island Museum. It has a, it has some wonderful exhibits up there. Uh, and, and if you do, definitely go and look at the uh, at the Tennyson William E. Tennyson is uh, is their big log boat. Oh, I have a question. You indicated earlier. That had a 671 Detroit in it. Did it come with that? Is it still retained? It, it's, uh, it's in the boat now. Yes, that's what we're operating. It had a, it, it, it was it's actually the fourth engine, but it's the third type that was in it. It originally had a 24 horse Lathrop gasoline engine, two some of the gasoline engine when it was built. Uh, and then later, and I suspect it was when it changed hands around 1939, it got, um, they, they, I think, installed a D80 Lathrop diesel, 80 horsepower. And then probably when they went to dredge, that's when it went from freight work and they started dredging oysters with it, so they probably repowered it then. It got a Detroit 671 in the early 50s, which was more, more than likely a surplus, World War II sur surplus engine. Um, it had, the boat had sunk numerous times by the time we got it. Um, and uh, the engine was, you know, not any good, to say the least. And it, I think it had been part of that anyway, so uh, we basically trashed that whole thing. And then we got one donated to us Henry Lackey, who you, some of you know around here, the diesel, diesel mechanic on Delta Mill, was repowering a boat, uh, a yacht that somebody had, a 671, and, and the guy was happy to donate it to us. And Henry knew the, knew the engine and knew the shape because he had maintained it. And he said, this is, this, you, you know, you got to take it. So, uh, so we did. And uh, sure enough, it was all ready to go when we were ready to go. And it's in there now, and it runs like a top. And it'll probably keep on. There's still plenty of them working on it, but you know, with dead rises and all. Quite a few of them. Any other questions? What kind of fast swings would you use on a log boat? Um, that, but if you go way back, early log boats were trundles. Okay. All right, They're actually probably made out of either white oak or locusts. It would have been wood, wood pegs, basically. Uh, that went, that changed probably into iron fastenings. Uh, and then the later ones in the Crockett was done with uh, galvanized rod. Not big, bullets? Big, big. Well, they might have had some bullets in there. <laughs> but it would have, would have been a long one to go all the way through. Yeah. Yeah. But, 
The ones, the ones that hold up the best are the funnels, actually. They'll last longer than anything else. And it's interesting because uh, you brought that up. Up in the St. Michael Museum, they just finished uh, building the Dove, which is uh, uh, for the for the uh, uh, St. Mary City. Thank you, St. Mary City uh, boat. And they went back to using a lot of tunnels to put that boat together, just for that reason. Locus, locus tunnels, uh, and that, and, and bronze, uh, and a lot of it. You know. So that's uh, that certainly would have been the way to do it. But that's that's sort of the evolution of a lot of building. That's it definitely did from the start. Yeah. Anyone else? You brought up an interesting question in the costume. Uh, I'm curious how the joints were made. Were they just butted together? Yeah, how were the joints made in a log boat? Just like just like you would do the on a on a on a on a dead rise boat or whatever, you know, the single plank, you just fit them together. It's not real simple with great big logs, but and I don't have I don't have anything on here that I can show you. But uh, uh, basically, they started by shaping logs, and, uh, and then they, they would bring them together, kind of squeeze them together, run a saw down between them, and keep doing that until they fit together tightly, so they got a tight fit. And then they would have been caulked like you'd caulk a bottom with, uh, with uh, cotton, oakum, tar, you know, whatever. And uh, it worked fine. <laughs> it works fine, you know. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. You can see the how the chunks go. That's the chunks in the bow. If you think about the bottom being just the logs put together, if you want to get that shape in the bow, you have to add stuff in there, and they had a process for doing that. And I can that's way would be to show you if I had something. Actually, I've got some stuff out in the, in the boat shop to show how. How our boat was put together, but yeah, it's just all fitted together. Yeah. Yeah. How, how are the uh, curves? Well, it's sculpted. It's sculpted. It's shaped. Okay. It's after actually a sculpture. So yeah, and that's and that's why you run out of them. That's why you, you know, that's what you run. That's how you run out of it. You know, if you try to fit it up into the bow, going up the logs. And then they, they cut them down, and then they start putting what we call chunks on an angle in there. So would they use a draw plane or something? They used every hand tool they could imagine that would do the job. But yeah, definitely broad axe, foot ads, lip ads, saws, you know, draw knives, planes, anything they could, you know, could come up with. But yeah, and they got good at it. I mean, the finishes on some of these. And that goes back to what we were talking about with the round sterns. Most of those round sterns were for chunk round sterns, pieces put together and then shaped. And when they were when they were building those boats later on, they, there was actually there was one guy here in the county, a black guy, that, that was really an expert with a lip ads for shaping logs. He learned the trade building log boats. And he would come when they got to that point, and he'd come and, and uh, shape, finish the, the log, uh, log stern on the boat. And they said when he got through with a, with a, with a lip ads, the ads is the, is the ads with the lip on the side, so you don't get a scratch every time using it. Uh, but he would he would uh, shape that thing out with that ads, and they said, boy, he didn't hardly have to hit with a piece of sandpaper before he. Put a primer to paint on it. So, um, but that. Uh, how much does uh, the Crockett uh, leave? You, you mentioned uh, these boats sinking uh, multiple times over their history. And how, how do you make sure it never leaks again? Never sinks again. How do you make sure that the Crockett doesn't sink? Um, when it, when it's, it has, well, it, it has sunk at least once 
sense of came here. That was like the third day of the city. <laughs> um, but we've gotten that under control. Pumps, basically, we've got three of them in there right now, at least. And I'm thinking about adding another one, and that's not a, that's not a joke. Um, but but yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Uh, I've got it now, so that it doesn't leak much. And in fact, when it sits out of here for a while, especially this time of year. You know, it gets, it gets a little bit of stuff, gets sucked up into the cracks and so on. Uh, and it, it'll pump once, twice, three times a day, throwing a couple of gallons out, you know. Um, and that's certainly acceptable you know, in a hundred year old boat. That's not, that's not, that's not bad. And that's, by the way, it is, it'll be a hundred years old next year. And we're going to have a big birthday party. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's going to be a big one. Uh, and we could we could use some help with that if anybody wants to help us get that organized. And so on. And somebody in the back had a question. Yeah, John. Let me ask you to put your future looking hat on just a little bit. Uh, you brought us up to today on what you've been doing. What does the boat shop need to be doing five, 10, 15 years from now? Kind of make sure that these very valuable skills don't get lost and are encouraged wherever the seeds may fall for you know, being good seeds to sell. Thank you. Tell Thank me, you. what do you think needs to be happening? Very good question. Very good question. And, and I've certainly given it a lot of thought, a lot of time. Everybody hear what you asked? Uh, about it being long term, where we're going from here. Um, and I should have probably gone into that more anyway. Yes, I have th thought long and hard about what we're doing and where we're going with it. Uh, I'm certainly, I've, I've done a lot in that direction just by starting to build boats out of there ourselves and, and to have the Living Museum. We're trying to, we are documenting as much of that as we can. I'd like to do more documentation. Uh, of what we are, are doing with videos and so on. Um, we don't have the skills and the technique to do all that at this point. Again, that would be somebody that we'd love to <coughs> come along and try to work with us more on recording that stuff. Um, I, can, I intend to continue with the interviews that we've done with, with boat builders and other people in the trades. Uh, and all of this stuff that we're doing is being archived uh, in the museum. And that's one of the important things that we uh, are doing here in the museum is, is to keep these archiving going. Um, where, uh, for instance, where we've got all of Larry Tuning stuff that's going to be down here uh, before we get through. I hope. Um, but, but what I think what and what I. What I would love to be able to do is maybe get some uh, some people who are interested in actually uh, building dead rise boats in particular, not just the flat bottom spheres, uh, and get them in here and get them with hands on and let, let them build a boat if, they, if they're interested in it. But it takes to do that though. <clears throat> when you're not going to do a dead rise boat in, in a week, uh, at least not one that I'm going to go out in. But, uh, it can be done. I mean, I'd love to work with anybody who wants to try and do one. Um, and, you know, but they would have to make a commitment if they wanted to do that. They have to make a commitment to come in and work on a regular basis uh, and probably put a little skin in the game, too, to get materials and so on. Um, and, and then they could either keep the boat or, or we take it and sell it or whatever. That wouldn't matter. Uh, but that's another uh, kind of a idea that I've got. It would be nice to be able to uh, to continue with. Hey, John, good time to ask, or for you to answer the question. Explain to the folks who don't know the difference between a dead rise and a flat bottom, then they have more appreciation for it. I uh, um, yeah, well, a flat bottom skiff basically um, is is what it says, just a flat bottom. It's only got a little rocker to them, but it's just sides down to the chine and then turn almost 90 degrees and come across, or it is 90 degrees. Well, it depends on the angle of the 
side. Uh, the dead rise boat is basically a V bottom boat, and which means uh, the angle of the bottom, the entry where the bow is almost vertical in the bottom, and it twists all the way back to the stern. Uh, some of them are actually flat, or it maybe carries a little bit of beef back to the stern. And the term dead rise, so everybody asks, well, what's a dead rise? What does that mean, dead rise? I've heard a lot of definitions, but I'll go with my own definition. <laughs> um, dead rise means a dead straight line from the keel, the keel rabbit, we call it, the keel where the, where the plank fits into the, where the, where the planking fits into the keel. It makes a dead straight line to the chine, which the chine is the point where it turns from the bottom and into the side. It's a dead straight line with a rise of the keel from the keel up to the chine, and that's the rise. It changes. What is the rise on a dead rise boat? It's, it's from zero to 180 is what it amounts to. But that's, that's a simple explanation of what a dead rise is. Some people refer to the, to the staving in the bow as the dead rise on the boat. Well, yes, it is, but it continues all the way to the boat. But that's my definition, and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> You'll hear a lot of other ones, they're all, and they're all good. They're all done for, for a reason, so it doesn't really matter. But. I, I've noticed all your boats run the okay. they, got, they, got little, they got a little beat to them. Some, right, of, right, some, right, some right, of them. Right. Straight. I've seen a documentary on Dead Rise Flatty where they actually come up some right around where the prop is, and I forget what you call that feature. That's the horn timber that comes up and does that shape. Okay. Now, what he's talking about is, is, your, is your inboard powered. Dead rise boat. And that's what that's all about. Um, they carry the bee in the dead rise back to where the shaft comes out. Right. And then it starts to go up. And that's what they call a guinea horn timber that has a shape. And the reason they want to get back up to the flat in the round stern or the box stern or the diamond stern and get back to that flat behind where the where the wheel is, where the prop is. Right is because they want that flat surface to keep the boat from sinking down in the stern when you start to go fast. It's a semi-planing hull, which means it's, it's being driven beyond its normal hull speed. Okay, I don't want to go into too much technical detail there. But that's, 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 what, you, that's what you've observed, and, and when they're out of the water, you can see how that's how that's built, but that's the reason they come up with that horn timber okay. uh, in the back is to give a flat area to keep it from squatting in the back. Uh, you mentioned the local woods that are used. I'm just wondering, you know, wooden boats have been built all over the world, and leaving aside economics and availability, is there any other type of wood, mahogany, ipa, or any? Woods other than what's available here that if you had a choice you'd rather use? <laughs> That's a good question. I've only, I haven't used but so many kinds myself, and I know what I, you know, I'm, I started 50 years ago. And there's different stuff out there, and I have a lot of South American woods that come in that some guys swear by. I don't have any experience with it. Um, but like any, any of these woods, and talking to guys that, that have been using some of the new types and so on. Uh, it's like any wood, it's just a matter of picking the right stuff, you know. You can get crappy, wanna wood and all, you know, and you can get good stuff. Mahogany is the same way, you know. Um, years ago, I, built, I did a lot of work with uh, Philippine mahogany, which I really like, that's pretty durable, Honduras mahogany. Some of the lot of mahoggies. Um, if, if it wasn't so expensive, I'd love to build some more with it, but it's pretty expensive. Uh, and I don't think it's really worth it. Uh, as long as I've got white cedar, I'm going to 
to keep working with that. I'm having trouble finding any good stuff right now, but I'm going to keep on looking. I mean, that's, I mean, the, the Atlantic White Sea is something that would be, you know, the people all over the world would want. I would definitely, uh, I think if I had to go further afield, I'd rather go west and try to go after maybe some Alaskan yellow cedar or Port Orford cedar or something like that from that west. There's still some of that around that's, that's available. Um, but certainly, you know, and th then you get all over the world, yeah, you see guys building with, most of the, the rugged ones, I mean, you know, they just built with what they had. And like all of these boats, you gotta remember these work boats, they were built for 20 year life. They built it, they, you know, all these guys would contract for somebody to build a boat, they figured they got 20 years out of the hard work. That was it, you know. And then usually what would happen, it would get sold to some other poor guy that couldn't afford anything else. And he, uh, you know, instead of spending the money on a new boat, he'd spend it on the old boat, you know. So, and, and, you know, and here we are with the crime, 100 years old, you know, so that's, that's five, five generations, <laughs> shall we say, uh, of it. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. There's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff out there that I haven't worked with, so I don't really, I can't really comment on, it, but so much of it. But I mean, we still, I still got some good white oak now. You know, I mean, that's, that's still, it's not readily available, but it's, it's around, so I can still get that, and that's certainly a local wood that's available. Um, and, Cypress, I can still get a little bit of cypress. But, uh, but yeah, you, know, you do what you gotta do. Anyone else? If, if, if not, I- Right, Don McNeil wants to oh. speak. Hey, I, just, wanna, I, can, I can talk yeah. from here. Um, I just uh, wanted to say that there's a recap of John's very interesting uh, presentation with pictures in the history of the uh, Maritime Museum, which came out last year, our first 20 years, the must-have book. Um, <laughs> there are over 300 color pictures, and uh, if uh, you missed it, you want to review what John said, it's in this book, $20. They're for sale right over here. Thank you, John. There you go. There's the opportunity. Um, I, I just want to remind everybody we've got refreshments in the back. And uh, please, please uh, help yourself uh, before you go. And uh, I am willing to go ahead and open up the boat shop for anybody who wants to go ahead and see what's going on in there right now. So.